She's an award-winning YouTuber and best-selling author obsessed with helping you go after the life you want. I like it. Join her as she seeks out the stories and strategies. Give me every little detail. Of extraordinary people who found success. I'm going to get emotional. Oh, my God. Welcome to Detail Therapy with Amy Landino. I, I'm the type of person that just believes you put your head down, you're nice to everybody, you work your off, and good things happen. Like, it's really as simple as that. As long as your intent is always in the right place, and you're really good to everybody, and you have amazing work ethic, things tend, good things tend to happen to you. It's as simple as that. So for me to be like, five years out, I need to have this, this, and this, that's just setting expectations that are weird to me. Good morning, good life. Welcome back to Detail Therapy. You just heard a little bit of my chat with the founder of purewow.com and CEO of Gallery Media Group, Ryan Harwood. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how he found out his career out of college wasn't the right move, the role of inertia in decision making and how it might be a negative, and what Ryan did to start discovering what his career moves should be when he was at a job he knew he was going to have to leave. We have a lot to get into today. I'm so excited to share this episode with you. But if you're new, my name is Amy Landino. I'm the host of this show. I'm also a YouTube creator, professional speaker, author, and entrepreneur. And I'm here to help you go after the life that you want. You can find out more details by going to youtube.com slash amytv. Before we get into the chat with Ryan, you know what time it is. It's spring cleaning with Lingo. You might remember in episode seven of Detail Therapy, I sat down with Christy Lingo, a professional organizer and overall fabulous lady here from Columbus, where I live. And in these April episodes, we are doing little snippets of how you can spring clean in your life this season so that you can start getting a little happier at home and organizing things all around you so that you can focus on your goals. So let's jump into our tip this week with spring cleaning with lingo. Let's do a little bit more spring cleaning with lingo. Christy Lingo from Simple Solutions Organizing.com. How you doing, Lingo? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing well, but I'm a little hungry, so I'm afraid to talk about this topic right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to talk about organizing the areas of our kitchen that are hiding things from us. You open up the the fridge, you open up the pantry, it's got all kinds of stuff, old and new. And that's gross. It's when you're hungry, gross. it's even more gross. <laughs> so how are we gonna organize these areas of our home? Well I want to start by sort of talking about why you would want to get organized. And that is we throw away 1.3 billion tons, billion tons of food every year. Mm. Yeah, that's a lot. That's and that's lot. from the Berea or Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition and like, yeah, like the pasta. So they're, yeah. they're trying to get us to have less food waste. And if you know what you have and you know what you need, you're going to be much less likely to have to throw it away. So you're going to be able to find it when you need it. And you're going to know that you need to replace it. So one of the first things that I want you to do is to go through everything that's in your fridge and in your pantry or in your cupboard, wherever you keep the food, because you need to make sure that what's in there is good. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to go grab that mayonnaise and have it be a little stinky. And I feel like if you don't always see like an expiration date on something, you're just sort of like, well, maybe it still has a chance. <laughs> so how do you assess, how do you assess this? Well, okay. So if you've got open condiments in your refrigerator and say you've been having hot dogs with cookouts that we're having this spring, or, you know, you're making sandwiches with mayonnaise, every time you stick a knife in there or you're opening this container, you're letting bacteria in. Mm. So you should really think about sort just of- Just got that down, visual. Yep. Paring down those <laughs> condiments every four to six months, just because you don't want to let them sit around for too long. So even if they've got an expiration date, that's like two years down the road, that's two years sitting on a shelf from the date that it was processed. Mm -hmm. So you really want to kind of keep that in your mind, like do this seasonally, go out, throw out the condiments. If you've got cans in your cupboard, if it's something acidic, like a fruit or a tomato sauce or tomatoes, those only last like one to two years in a can, everything else you're going to have about four years. But in general rules, if you can't remember when you purchased it, go ahead and get rid of any sort of jar or can or thing that's like that. And then another area that I think that we often ignore is our spice rack. Like I was going <laughs> to ask about spices. I was just 
just looking at them yesterday. Um, I actually bought a nice little organizing container on Amazon and I labeled all of them and they're in the same type of container with just the same looking labels. It's very uniform looking. It's very cute. But I started thinking as I was putting them in the containers, I was like, I don't know how old this spice is. <laughs> and now they all look like they're the same age. <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's a little scary and I'm curious of what should I have thrown out? Well, and if you buy something, you know, say you only need cumin for one recipe and then it sits in your cupboard so for the next annoying. year. You don't know. So it's one to two years if that spice has already been ground. So if it's the flakes or it's a, if it's already ground up. But then if it's the whole spices, you can actually have three to four years. You know, if you've got oh, wow. whole nutmeg or cinnamon sticks or something like that. But again, in general rule, if you can't remember when you bought it or if it, you know it's been hanging around, you've moved and that spice moved with you. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, how many times have I moved and brought my spices with me? Yeah. Oh. But a tip, you could take a Sharpie and just write the date that you bought it or put it into that jar on the bottom. And then you kind of have an idea. And That's a good that, practice. Yep, just that every time you buy right a spice, off. because some recipe, like yesterday, I made something because we've got a, a holiday coming up that I'm making something for. And I was like, oh, that's a spice I didn't have before. And now all of a sudden I need it. And what I need a half a teaspoon of it. When am I going to use it again? It's probably really good to just be in the practice of writing the date or use your label maker. Oh, you as use I always your like label to do. Maker. Yeah. So once you've got everything pared down to what is actually good in the food in your kitchen, go ahead and sort them how you use them. So I typically, when I'm doing a pantry, will do something like, what do you eat for breakfast? Put your oatmeal, your peanut butter, all of those things, your bagels, all of that in one area. You know, what do you use for meal prep? And put your your spices and your salt, your oils, your vinegars, your, you know, if you've got rice or or macaroni and cheese, put all of that kind of together in one space because you're going to be more likely to be able to say, what do we need for breakfast? You go to your cupboard and you can see everything that you eat for breakfast and know how to to make your grocery list, which is my next tip of doing an inventory before you go to the grocery store, rather than just sort of wandering the aisles and being like, what do we need? Well, that's when you end up with duplicates and triplicates of the things that are in your house. And that's what leads to the waste. Yeah. I, the number of times where I regretted not checking if I had something before I went to the grocery store, because it's like, why is it on my grocery list? If I just could have just checked before I left, if I have it. But then there's always the time where you're like, oh, I want that. Do I have that? Yeah. Do I have that right now? I no lie. I have a client where I was organizing her pantry and she had 12 cans of black beans. And she's Why? like, I always buy them because I know that I eat them, but I don't remember if and I've got I them. And I'm like, you have them. Please don't buy them for like a year. <laughs> Alert the press. Yeah. She's good on the black beans over here. Okay. That's funny. Everybody has that thing. Everybody Absolutely. has that thing in their pantry or in their fridge. So go find out what that thing is for you. Tweet at us. <laughs> Tell us what your thing was. What do you have 12 of that you did not need to have 12 of, but now you're going to eat more of because you have it. Great tips. Thank you so much, Lingo. Hey, if you want to hear more from her, she was on episode seven of Detail Therapy. She's also been doing this segment with us all month to help us with our spring cleaning. But Lingo, what are you working on elsewhere? What are you excited about? I would love to have you give a listen to my Cocktails and Containers podcast. I love that, that I name have. so much. It's the best podcast name. <laughs> it is the ma perfect marriage of two of my absolute favorite things, home organizing tips and cocktails. Yes. Enough said. Go yeah. and listen to that. And um, we'll put that in the show notes. Christy Lingo, thanks for being here. We'll see you on the next one. Sounds good. Thanks again, Christy, for coming on. And I just want to remind you, if you've been listening to these tips, if you've been loving them, if you love lingo like I do, I think she is so smart and so funny and so much fun. You have to check out her podcast. I highly recommend it. Cocktails and Containers. We'll make sure it's linked in the show notes. It's totally worth subscribing to for these additional quick tips. And I know you love podcasts, so pop over there. All right, now let's get into it with my next guest. Today, I'm sitting down with Ryan Harwood. Ryan is the CEO of Gallery Media Group, which is focused on building media brands that truly matter to the end consumer through distinct editorial missions, voice, and aesthetic. Their overall mission is to make positivity louder. At Gallery Media Group, it includes a women's lifestyle brand called Pure Wow, and Ryan was actually the founder of of the woman's lifestyle brand, Pure Wow. And this is a resource dedicated to making a woman's life more beautiful, manageable, and efficient on a daily basis. In January 2017, Pure Wow was acquired by Gary Vaynerchuk as the first property under the newly formed Gallery Media Group, which is a sister company to the digital agency, VaynerMedia. Let's get into it with Ryan Harwood. Ryan Harwood, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Why do you do what you do? 
I'm in the digital media industry, and it allows me to use both my creative side of my brain, but also the the commercial and business side of my brain, which is something that um, stimulates me every single morning when I wake up. So, you know, I was in the finance world for a long time, and that really satisfied one side of the brain with numbers and financial and commercial side. But, you know, I learned something about myself, and I, I actually am a little bit more of a creative, and I really do like exercising that side of the brain a lot. So... Uh, That's why I do what I do. I love that. And I'm glad that you brought this up because I feel like there's this huge elephant in the room and people have probably asked you this many, many times. You are running Gallery Media Group, which houses a couple of different things. But the first uh, platform that you launched was Pure Wow. That's right. And Pure Wow is a lifestyle resource for millennial women. Mm -hmm. And and I want to talk about the white space that you filled at that point. But you're coming from a career at Goldman Sachs. How long were you there? I was at Goldman for about five years. So that's a really different trajectory. And the elephant in the room is, why is this man running a women's lifestyle resource and one that's helpful at that? Really, really well done. Um, So I I think we'll get to that. But can we kind of like backtrack a little bit? How did you end up going into finance? Because what you do now and why you do it, it seems like it'd be really different than maybe what was happening earlier on in your life that would make you think like, oh, I should probably go into finance. For sure. Inertia, mm. meaning, um, so I was a, an athlete my whole life. I, I played tennis majority of my life, even the juniors competitively. I played in college. I was the captain of the tennis team at UPenn, played professionally for a year after college. Um, when I was in at UPenn, I, I went to the business school. So f- it's funny, Wall Street and finance was something that um, if you had good grades, especially my generation, and you went to an Ivy League school, you were, I don't want to say brainwashed to some extent, but that was kind of where it was at. Mm. And the inertia pushed me there. And when you're young, you don't know what you want to do for a living. Um, I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. It was more, I think of it more like dating, where it's like, process of elimination. You got to try something to figure out what you don't like in order to get to what you do like. Um, so at that stage, it was, it was more pure inertia that pushed me to that. And I was good with numbers. I really, math was my strongest subject growing up. So it made sense from a common sense perspective. Um, but ultimately what I realized is when I got to a certain stage of of that career move, the fire in my belly that I had as an athlete was completely not there. Mm. And when I looked in the mirror, it felt like my identity of what actually who I associated with from an inspirational, aspirational perspective, it just wasn't mapping to my DNA, which is why I had to leave that industry. That's super interesting because it sounds like, you know, inertia and and who you were surrounding yourself with, it sort of seemed like, well, this, this makes sense, right? Would you credit the fact that it's something you tried and I'm, I assume it's not a regret of yours at all, right? You learn everything and everything that you do, but by going into that career, it was very much, this seems to be the consensus of what is what, what everybody's looking to do. So I should just also do that. That's A, but also B was, you know, when you're young and you're a ambitious young person, yeah. m- money was a factor. Mm. You wanted to make money. You, mm-hmm. you and you know, finance was a place that felt, you know, particularly when I was for the five years, pr- when I was in college, prior to college, and even when I was coming out, finance was the place to be. If you were trying to make money, that was where the money was at. So at first I was chasing money. And then as I matured, um, I was chasing happiness. And what you've learned is that when you're chasing happiness, actually the money comes um, organically. But that's just not, you don't know to think that way when you're coming out of college or even if you don't go to college, like you're young and and you're literally just doing what you think is best in order to, to be financially successful. So as you were saying, you know, your, your, um, ambition that you'd had before the excitement that you'd had in sports before these were all fizzling out by the time you were thinking, okay. And then that's when the gear was switched right from money to happiness. It's like, how, now, how am I going to find that? Was, was it a culmination of things? How long do you think it was? You know, I just think about the moment I decided when I was going to leave my job and then actually did. How long do you think that that period of time was for you? At least a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that stuff, I know people are like, ah, you don't like it. You got to get out and go. And <laughs> that, I mean, that may work for that some people. That sounds so sexy. Yeah. But. <laughs> it, it, for me, that was unrealistic. I, I also am someone that 
for better or for worse, this is pro- this is probably been, it's a blessing and a curse. Meaning, I like to hedge certain downside and risk. Um, so sure, I could have got up and left and figured something out, but I felt like why not? I wasn't unhappy. I just wasn't thrilled and happy. Mm-hmm. If you're miserable, then sure, you got to get out because you don't want to live that life. You're taking that life home with you to your friends, blah, blah, blah. And that's just not a good existence. I wasn't miserable by any means. I actually liked my job. I just didn't like it enough where I was going, when I was thinking, when I'm 45 years old, could I picture myself doing this? And I'm like, no, I cannot. Interesting. Did you just come to that occurrence to yourself? Like, did you think that to yourself that, oh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm good. I, and I could do this. I don't, I don't see myself doing this. I don't see this as the future. Or was there someone around you going like, no, there's next level happiness that like maybe uh-huh. you could have? Um, yeah, I had a, f- I had a few, not like aggressively, but I definitely vividly remember a few of my best friends being like, you know, your skill set is not being fully utilized where you are currently. You probably can find something that might be better for you. And I had multiple conversations with them and my family as well. And um, But nobody was like pushing me by any means because, listen, you're at Goldman Sachs. Like, it's a good cushy it's job. kind of hard to talk you out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like, yeah. So it was one of those things where um, nobody was pushing, but everyone was, was seating because they knew that I was – I was kind of like, I don't want to say coasting, but it just wasn't maximizing potential mm. by any means. Yeah. And I knew that, you know that when you, you know, feel that inside you. So, but I also wanted to be patient and find something that I thought was going to increase the odds of making sure that I was happy going to work every day. And that's when I started speaking to everyone and anyone that would have a conversation that was successful in various industries just so I could start understanding different industries because I didn't know what I was in finance my whole life I didn't know what the other and what they did uh, what they really did right you you know what you hear they do but what really goes on day to day so I started meeting with anyone and everyone just trying to figure out which industry sounded like it could map to to what I thought I'd be good at and this was back in Oh nine, um, and eventually kept finding myself gravitating back towards media technology, but you know the media landscape content, um, and that's when I started exploring that world for the first time. Interesting. What What do you think was the most intriguing about it right off the bat? When When people were saying you could try this, you could try that. This is what I'm doing. This is what they're doing. What was it about? That that seemed like okay. I think that's something that where my expertise could really, really shine, even though it may not be exactly my bag yet. Yeah, the passion that I felt across the table from those people, how excited they were mm-hmm. about what they were building, um, how fun it seemed like they were having, how much fun they were having by building that business. So it wasn't so much about what I thought it was going to be, which is like day to day. I feel like that's good for my skill set. It was more like contagious passion and I'm like I want that Mm. I I want that for my life (laughs) and for my job I feel like that would be a lot of fun and I was confident enough in myself where I almost didn't care what industry I felt like I'd figure it out none of it could be rocket science unless I was going into rocket science (laughs) Uh, so I felt like I would figure it out and so it was much more about building businesses than it was about the specific industry itself so you're meeting with a lot of people and I assume this is all happening while you're at Goldman. You're just trying to like get the lay of the land. Mm-hmm. What else do you think you had to do before or what else did you do before you left that was really helping you decide, not just decide, but um, get you a little bit further while you're able to take a paycheck? Totally. So, you know, at first I, th- the natural inclination was to think that you should do something for men, given that I was a young guy at the time. Um, so when I, I actually serendipitously through a friend met a successful media owner, um, mogul, so to say, and he gave me market research from the early days of several companies he had invested in. It was a guy named Bob Pittman. He was the founder of MTV, ran a well time Warner, now iHeart. And, you know, in the early days, obviously he's someone that knew, he knew it all, right? It was someone that had success in this industry. Um, 
And when I looked at that market research, it was it was pretty obvious that women were considerably better consumers than men in every which way. They were consuming content more, creating content more, sharing content more. More of the, the ad budgets went towards women over men, and I knew that was how we were going to monetize. So for, I paused, and I said, you know, for six months, literally hired a moderator and just held focus groups with women, trying to figure out where the white space was, where they were spending time online, et cetera. Um, and that's how it landed on, okay, first it was media, then it landed on the specific demographic and cohort that I felt was giving me the greatest opportunity to potentially win in the industry. Hmm. That's great. So Pure Wow was first. Can you describe, let's talk about um, Gallery Media Group. Sure. If you just des- were to describe what Gallery Media Group does, yeah. and Pure Wow is a part of that, um, mm-hmm. uh, is at 1.37 p.m. Yes. is a part of that, um, how would you describe it to somebody so they can understand what the company does? Gallery Media Group is a portfolio of media brands that we're building and buying over time. So you can think of it just like you would a Condé Nast, a Viacom, a Hearst, anything like that. Uh, we're building it, obviously, in a very different way, um, mm-hmm. in the way that we feel modern media brands should be built, but that it's a portfolio of sorts. So when Pure Wow was acquired by Gary Vaynerchuk and Steve Ross two years ago, that's when we formed Gallery Media Group mm-hmm. to be a sister company to VaynerMedia, which is the agency that Gary had been building for 10 years, and VaynerX is the parent company above both businesses. Why do you think that those family, well, you and you and Gary working together or um, uh, Gallery and, and uh, VaynerX working together, like why did those feel like a good fit to partner up? Yeah. Content. Um, so we are huge believers that brands don't have enough content to fill the pipes these days to be culturally relevant. And I, there were synergies on the content creation side of things. You know, they were building a 50,000 square foot video studio in Long Island City. They were in the process of building. They obviously understood content contextually relevant on the platforms like Facebook and Pinterest, et cetera, better than anyone. Um, so we were really good at the time back then at creating editorial voice, understanding how to merchandise and monetize our audience in different ways that were modern. Um, in the advertising landscape. But what they were really good at is creating content at scale, cost efficiently, and understanding the platforms better than anyone else. And that was a synergy that I felt was really, really natural, even though the business models were completely and utterly different, and they still are. They make their money in a very different way than we make our money, though even the way we price out things. Um, our clients are very different than their clients. Sometimes there's overlap, but nothing to do with the fact that we're in the same building necessarily. Um, but it was really the content side of things and the talent. They had talent that they, they were a fertile playground for us to potentially pluck talent if somebody else wanted to start doing something else because they were trained in the ninja program that they do over there and content and you know media and everything else that it's a very natural switch for someone to come to the media and publishing side from an agency world. Hmm. Interesting. So I just wanted to nerd out on that for just a second. But it sounds like you really understood, especially with Pure Wow being sort of like this first big project and clearly very successful part of the gallery now, but the, a really great study on how well you know your audience. And so what would you say that you learned specifically from women as you were starting Pure Wow to make you look at these other other platforms that you're building and say, this is how we nail it. Like we know that women are good in terms of consumerism and they can really show us a lot, but was there something specifically you learned from them that you're now able to take to, I don't know if I know this for a fact, but one thirty-seven PM sound like isn't women's. I don't know if it's men's either, but it's more, it's a different vibe. For sure. Right. So was there something that you learned you could take over to these other places? A ton. I mean, Remember, I started Pure Wow nine years ago, mm-hmm. so it was a different mm-hmm. era. Everything has changed in media, seismic changes. So what we've learned a- along the way from like nine years ago to today about what works in terms of building a brand and where attention currently is and how to monetize being a brand and allowing other brand, uh, brands to siphon your equity from you from a voice perspective like we, yeah, a ton we've learned there. So it wasn't so much about learning from 
the audience specifically and the woman. It was much more about learning how to build a successful media brand and applying some of those pitfalls or successes to the next brand. But what's interesting is because it's such a different demographic, it skews much younger than Pure Wow does. It is skewing more male than female. Um, it's more multi culty in nature from an ethnicity perspective. So there's major differences. There is I love di- the phrase multi culty, by the way. I have never heard that. I am living for it. Yeah. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that. <laughs> so, you know, like even the fact that it skews younger male, um, text message. FaceTime, Twitch, these are platforms that we weren't heavy on on the PureWow side, whereas Pinterest is a huge area of focus for us on PureWow, but not on 1.37 p.m. So, you know, there are differences, but there's also learnings at the same time. Okay, so how did you, okay, a couple of things. There has to be a strong female presence for Pure Wow to be successful from a content standpoint. Oh, yeah, I had nothing Who, to do with it. Yes, no, I would, like, that's like for sure, for sure. It's not just like content science, right? So, but it kind of. So who, um, who is that yeah. for you, so for Pure Wow? It's many people. So mm-hmm. when I first started the business, um, it's, it's funny, we, we hired editors, of course, because that was the first area of need. I was not going to be creating the content. Um, and I have an editor, uh, Jillian Quint, who was number one partner in crime, started 15 days after I did. Oh, wow. Yeah, and she you know really created the voice of, of Pure Wow um, in those first couple years. Was pivotal, like leaned on her entirely to create the content and of course we hired other editors along the way so Jillian's still with me awesome knock on wood Jillian shout out (laughs) (laughs) um and you know she really runs the the pure wow brand from a content perspective um Mary Kate McGrath who was the editor-in-chief of pure wow starting three years in so around 2013 she was the editor-in-chief of pure wow is now the chief content officer of gallery media group as a whole so she oversees content and video and design and basically anything that's creative in nature um, across Gallery Media Group. Um, But she obviously had a major hand in creating, making Pure Wow what it was as well. So her and Jillian worked immensely closely um, in create, involving Pure Wow from 2013 to 2017, um, which is when the acquisition occurred and things changed from there. So Jillian and Mary Kate, maybe, or one of your other editors, or maybe just something you saw on purewow.com. I'm dying to know what a great tip is that <laughs> you've learned from the women's lifestyle world oh, uh, that you have started integrating into your life. Oh, man. Anything come to mind? <laughs> like, whoa, I didn't know that. I'm going to try that. You know, we we write about certain sleep tips Yeah. that obviously are universal in nature. And I absolutely, a lot of the wellness stuff a lot of the food stuff is this is the content that I will gravitate personally towards. Even sometimes I find it interesting, like the home decor stuff, given, you know, obviously I have a family and I'm at home. I, I read some of that stuff as well. But um, I'd say the sleep tips are things that I've leaned more heavily into or just like how to manage stress and anxiety and stuff like that. I always find it interesting to see what they come up with. Interesting. How well do you sleep? I sleep really well, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. I, I hate <laughs> I, it's almost like I feel bad like giving sleep tips because I'm like, ooh, I'm in a good spot in my life on yeah. that front. Um, what about anxiety? Do you suffer from anxiety on a certain level or is it just sort of like, oh, just anxiousness, just typical entrepreneurship yeah. nerves? You know, it's interesting. I never suffered from any anxiety whatsoever until I had kids. Really? Yeah. How old are they? Three and 10 months. Oh, wow. So- the anxiety really isn't business focused. Mm. Um, it's it's much more stems from like how you've you've never loved someone as much as like when you have children and when they're not capable of taking care of themselves. Like that creates certain thoughts in your mind. For me, at least, that like that has created some anxiety in my life for the first time. Um, but it never really. W- business related anything related to myself personally socially like that was not really something for me growing up thank god <laughs> so it sounds like it sounds like something 
finally kind of happened, and maybe this is a big assumption, but something finally happened to you that was a lot more out of your control and out of your like numbers and planning, and yeah. it's very much like mm, kids, they're gonna do what they do, and yeah, I'm not always with them. I'm at work all yeah. day, and you know, obviously, I travel and I'm on a plane, and you know, now it's like. You know, I don't want to go there with the dark yep, thoughts, yep, but it's like yeah. if you, 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 oh, I'm sure Gary helps on that front a lot. He's <laughs> so he's so good at that. Like, just think all the bad things all the time, and <laughs> you'll be really grateful for your life, right? <laughs> Thanks, G. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. So it is it is more out of my control. But you know, it's funny. The business at this point, the business is obviously I can only control so much when the business gets large, uh, how, how it's gotten. You know, we have over 200 employees now on the Gallery Media Group side alone. I can't touch everything by any means like I used to. So a lot of it is out of my control at this point as well. But for some reason, I'm able to say, you know, whenever any anxiety creeped into my mind in the past, I always, the way I, I counteracted it was, worst case scenario is what? Worst case scenario is we lose that client. Mm -hmm. What about after that? That person leaves, doesn't work with us anymore. What about after that? Company goes out of business. That's the worst case scenario. Am I, am I alive? I'm alive. Yeah. Do I have my health? I have my health. So I used to be able to do that and quickly be able to get it out of my mind that nothing's that big of a deal. Worst case scenario with kids is, is a big rough. deal. Yeah. And it's not something that you can be like, I'll get over that. Yeah. You're not going to get over that worst case scenario. So that's why it's been more challenging for me when, since I've had children. So what you've been doing now has been 10 years now. Is it, have you, have you had like the 10 year anniversary of, of pure wow or anything like that? It's 2000. So 2020 will be the 10 year anniversary. 10, 2020. Okay. So, but you've been working on this now for about 10 years. Is there something that you do or, or something that you're doing every in business or in life? Oh, I guess children could be it, but just in general in your everyday life that 10 years ago, you would be really surprised to hear that that was you in the future. Hmm. Not really. You know, it's interesting. I'm not the type of person that thinks too far in the future. Like when I used to be interviewed at places when I was trying to get jobs and they would be like, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, seriously? I hate that so much. Seriously? Yeah. Five <laughs> years? Like I I'm thinking about five months. Mm -hmm. Like I I'm the type of person that just believes you put your head down, you're nice to everybody, you work your ass off. And good things happen. Like, it's really as simple as that. As long as your intent is always in the right place and you're really good to everybody and you have an amazing work ethic, things tend, good things tend to happen to you. It's as simple as that. So for me to be like five years out, I need to have this, this, and this. That's just setting expectations that are weird to me. Mm -hmm. um, so... No, I Nothing think back really surprises then... surprises you about what you're doing anymore. Because I, I didn't know. Yeah. I just didn't ever attempt to think about what I was going to be mm -hmm. doing 10 years out. Um, low it, expectations. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't low. Exp I actually Just had like extremely <laughs> high expectations, but it wasn't mapped to specific milestones. Mm -hmm. It was, it was happiness and like coupled with a financial success and my employees happiness and just having a well-balanced life. And like, that's how I mapped back, like whether things are going well or not. Cool. Okay, so I went to my Instagram and I asked some questions, and I got a couple of good ones. One of them is from Golden Seeker ninety seven, who said, "What's the best way to stand out in a cover letter for Pure Wow or Gallery?" And just piggybacking off of that, what does it actually mean to be a good cultural fit here? Yeah. What, what do you look for? When, when, I assume you're a big part of the hiring still. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Golden Seeker. I appreciate <laughs> Hello, your question. Hello, Golden Seeker. <laughs> um, so my the first part of that, no cover letter. Ooh, good tip. Okay. <laughs> uh, Expand. I, I don't think I've ever read a cover letter. Really? If it's across my desk. No, no cover letter. You skip it, you go straight to the resume. I want you to write a very succinct email, body of the email, or Twitter, or however you, however you want to reach the person, a succinct two to three sentence why I should be paying attention to this. Mm. Anything over two paragraphs, even over one, to be frank, if you're reaching, trying to get in touch with a CEO, or any C-suite executive, that's deleted. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, it's deleted. They're not even looking at it. It's got to be one succinct paragraph about why you, I should pay attention to you. That's your cover letter these days, is like one paragraph. Then I will look at the resume to see if this is remotely even relevant to what we're trying to hire for or achieve. But at the very least, even if the resume is 
not relevant at all, if you wrote a good paragraph that got my attention, I'm either going to keep you on the back burner or I'm going to forward it around to the entire hiring managing committee being like, this this person's got Just something. Watch them. Yeah. yeah. Maybe could someone please meet with them, see if it's as real as I think it might be. Yeah. Yeah, no you just go with your gut. And what's funny is I think just to, to to echo that point, a lot of people think they have to present it all, present all evidence right at the start yep. in order to feel like they can win you over. But what you're saying is this quick paragraph, this tweet, what DM ideally would be awesome too, is permission to introduce the rest of this evidence, but something really strong yeah. that would even allow you to say, yeah, sure, send it over. Yes, and I think that, if I'm giving someone advice on corporate America, it might be a little bit different because they have the way they want to do things. And if you violate that, then they might think you're too casual for them. Mm. Um, but that's corporate America. So it depends on where you're trying to get the job. But if you're trying to get the job anywhere that is, you know, more entrepreneurial spirited in nature, whether that, because that could still be a big business, in my opinion, even if you're going to a massive business like Airbnb or um, Warby Parker or whatever it may be, like, I think those guys would still operate in the way that I'm talking about. Whereas maybe if you're trying to get a job at Campbell's or Procter & Gamble, you need to go the direction of the way their protocol is. But it comes down to doing your homework. Yes. Like you're just, you, you need to know who you're talking to. You yes. don't just fire off a bunch of resumes and hope that somebody's going to take, like, that's not the world we live in anymore. Correct. Yeah. I love that answer. Good. Such a good tip. No cover letter, you guys. Come on, get creative. <laughs> uh, CCL asked, what is the most realistic piece of advice you've received? Realistic piece of advice. Something actionable, it yeah. sounds like. So don't, don't. When I, was, when I was starting out, I had never been a CEO before. I had never been in media before. Um, and when you've never been in the industry and you've never been a CEO running a company before and you're a first-time entrepreneur, like a real entrepreneur, um, you don't necess- you're obviously going to have a little bit of self-doubt in the way you're doing things. Like, is this the right way to lead? Is this the right way to do things in media? Like, you've never done it before. So for the first maybe year and a half, two years, tried to emulate other leaders, tried to see what they were doing and replicate it accordingly. Um, that doesn't work. So the best advice that was re- I received was literally be the most genuine self you can possibly be. There is no blueprint for being a great CEO or being a great leader. It's being your version of it and you're going to find the people that want to follow you genuinely if you are just your truest self. So I think the best piece of advice is like, no matter what, don't be someone you're not. You will not win that game in the long run. You might win in the first quarter. When the buzzer rings, you're not going to win that game. So you should always be your most genuine self. Be If you have the right intent, then you can be radically candid to anyone. You can be completely transparent and honest. When you don't have the right intent, that's when you're trying to hide things. Mm -hmm. So if you have the right intent and you can always back it up with rationale, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be an open book. If someone comes to me and says, I want a raise, and I don't think they deserve a raise, then I want to tell them that I don't think it's time for their raise, or if they want equity in the business, and I don't think they should have equity in the business, or I want to be honest with them and give them a roadmap to maybe get there, but... Is long again, it's all about intent and being who you really should be. I feel like it would show a lot of intent using that example, which I really like. Of um, if someone actually is saying, I want a raise, or I want equity in the company, or some other either lofty or not goal, instead of just asking for it, which there's nothing wrong with asking, I think you definitely have to get into that habit if you're going to sort of pave your own way throughout your life, but again, just finding out more details about what it takes Mm -hmm. so that you can start actually executing on that. Cause it's very interesting. I think we deal with a lot of, um, I don't, I'm not claiming this of anyone that works here because I don't, really don't know your staff. But I think that there's an entitlement issue that happens a lot of the time. And it's because we sit at home, we stare at social, we make an assumption, we decide, oh, I should be making more money, you know. Yep. And, and then we just go in and we ask for it. But we don't actually know what it means to say to a business owner who's taken on a lot of risk here, here's what I want. But what does that actually mean from you? 100%. Which is... Yeah, and, and the most challenging part of it is as a boss is like, 
a lot of that is can be intangible. It's not necessarily quantifiable, right? It's not black and white necessarily. Maybe for a sales team, it's black and white. But for most other positions, it's not black and white. So therefore, it's like you need to make yourself invaluable, mm. right? I cannot lose you as an employee. And that's when you're going to be someone that deserves whatever it is you deserve, right? Otherwise, it's like it's fairly arbitrary, and that what, that's what makes it challenging. But when you have you can you have to have those conversations. The tough conversations is what makes you a good leader or not, in my opinion. It's the tough conversations. Absolutely, good advice. Okay, so this is called detail therapy. So I have to get into some major details okay. of your life. And as you were saying earlier, you don't really know what the successful people are doing until you sit down and you have a conversation with them about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So let's start with first thing in the morning. What is it like to wake up as Ryan Harwood? What's your morning routine every day, sure. or is it routine? Does it change up? What does it usually look like? It changes up because um, two days a week it's gym, so I'm immediately going to the gym and getting my workout in to try to take care of you know my health and wellness. Um, other days, I want to play with the kids for a little bit in the morning, so I might play with them for a half an hour before I start diving into work. The, like this morning, I didn't have that luxury because I had an early meeting, and we have an enormous event tonight, and I'm back-to-back the whole day, so I had to dive straight in, so I woke up and dove straight in. So it does change depending on what the, the construct of the day looks like, but my ideal situation is... Half half the time I'm going to be going to the gym immediately and half the time I'm maybe going to be playing with the kids for, you know, the first half an hour of the day and then diving into work and, you know, coming straight to work. So what do you do when you're at the gym? If it's a gym day, what's your go-to regimen there? What do you tend to do the most often? You know, it's funny. I For a while, as I, as I got older... I thought like, oh, I'm just going to do cardio. Like cardio is going to be the thing that like there. <laughs> keeps me lean and in shape, but like it doesn't at all. Um, so I actually have gotten back to what I did when I was younger. And I just thought I used to be, I thought I was too old for it. Like my body's going to ache and stuff, but I am, I'm lifting again. I'm doing plyometrics. I'm like doing the things that were, what I did when I was a, a college athlete and that, and I mix in cardio also, but like it's dynamic hit type exercises, but I have a, I have a trainer that helps me with this stuff and keeps it fresh all the time. But so yeah, I'm, I'm doing weight training, et cetera. So, and it, it, with, with that, going to the gym, sometimes you're with the kids, um, probably balancing schedules with your wife and, and your home life. How do you schedule your life overall? Like, what does it look like for you to go, what am I doing today? And, and also just communicating that with your family. So they know that dad's not going to be around as much today. Yep. Um, but there, you know, there'll be mornings where we'll be playing again, but today's going to be a long day. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I, I, the same way I try to be completely transparent with my employees, I'm completely transparent with my kids. And I'll see like, you know, daddy has to go to work today. Um, I will see you tomorrow morning. Or, you know, I can't wait for the weekend. Soon the weekend's going to be here and you've got daddy all to yourself type thing. So mm-hmm. I'm just, I completely explain it as if they understand it, whether they do or not is a different story. Um which I think they do, actually. Definitely the three-year-old, not the 10-month-old. <laughs> sure. Uh, so <laughs> Fun visual, though. Yeah. you got to prep them, you know? <laughs> I'm going to work today, son. <laughs> um, so I'm completely transparent on that front. In terms of how do I schedule, my Bible is is my calendar. What like calendar do you use? Google. Google, yeah. So it since day one, so we, well, uh, right? we've, the whole business is run off of Google. Yeah. So... Since yeah, since day one. So the you know the G Suite. So we um, my calendar is literally my Bible. My inbox is my Bible, my to do list. Um, it's funny because a lot of people in this organization run their life off of this, off of the mobile phone. And you know, Gary, I've got some peers on on the other side of the business that they text. They run their life off of text, which is foreign to me um i text a lot but not for like oh i could not agree more with you right now like it's I so totally difficult to look keep at track email of and everything. text differently yeah, yeah. text yeah. is for quick answers quick hits for me at least but other people literally run their entire multi-million dollar businesses off of text and dm and it's wild to me so i do i've had to adjust certain things yeah. Which is fine. Like it's expand. It just makes it more chaotic. And I keep trying to push back so hard. I'm like, okay, I know everybody wants to WhatsApp and text me and all this stuff. But like, 
okay, we've Slack, I've got figured out, okay? Yeah. But so if it's not in Slack, if it's not in Trello and it's not in email, like it's a total variable if this thing's going to happen. Right. If you slipped it into my DMs, I immediately have to say, send an email to this. Um, and, and so, you. yeah. Me and you both. Oh, yeah. I have, a, I have a funny reputation here being as like the email king because that's what I always say is I say, if you want to make sure this is getting done, you got to send me an email. Exactly. Like, I can't promise you I'm going to remember that text message and I'm going to get seven more and it's going to get pushed down. Slack, I don't even go on. The company does run on sure. Slack, yeah. but I don't go on it because I'll never remember anything. I won't. I won't see it. I, I, I'm on the run too much. So I need I need a home base that yeah. can be everything that I need to get to, which is what I do You know, in the morning. In the morning and the evenings, I get to that. Because the day, I, I'm not in my inbox. Like, I literally, during the day, I'm in back-to-back meetings. So I, I work late at night, and that's when I catch up, and I get to do my to-do list stuff. Yeah, totally. Totally agree. But I'm not saying that's necessarily the, the right. right thing. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 what's, it's what's right for you. It's, what, it's how now. you work. And get, yes, and for now, and until they're going to twist your arm further to do something else. But if the reality is... Whenever you are available, that's the place you go and are most efficient. It's going to be kind of hard for your you, the people who support you to say, "Well, we know how to get in front something in front of Ryan if we need to get approval from Ryan on yes. something." So, I mean, just sorry guys, work with it. That's okay, right. it's efficient, it's searchable, it's labelable, it's all those things. Exactly. When you have the time, or when you make the time, what do you do for self care? So I go to the gym. Um, I like the steam room. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> I go for a swim sometimes. Um, I am a huge basketball and tennis guy. You know, those are the two sports that I love. So if I get to play those, I'm the happiest person in the world. Um, And also I'm a diehard Knicks fan, as you can tell. Uh, So if even going to a game, I feel like is cathartic for me. You know, when I'm just sitting there in Madison Square Garden, it's, it's very, it's my happy place. Yeah. So you know, taking care of myself as well as doing those extracurriculars. Uh, is there any resource that you tend to to read other than Pure Wow, of course, or, <laughs> or 1.37 p.m.? Is there any resource you tend to read on a regular basis that if, if there's any pulse you feel like you need to be on? I don't consume a lot of content. Um, of course, I'm on the platforms, so things that come across to me. On Instagram and Twitter, I, if it catches my attention, I will I will definitely read articles for sure. But I, it's not like I go to a destination as my place that I'm digesting content. Uh, so it's much more what gets pushed to me and curated to me through Instagram and Twitter probably. Um, Are you much of a reader? Books? Nope. No? Not into it? Not even audio? Nope, which is goes against my business model a little bit. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we, yeah, we have a podcast company, gallery podcast company where we have a bunch of shows underneath it, but you know, I'm, I'm practical. This is, this is where attention is right now. This is where attention is shifting constantly. So even though me personally, I'm not a consumer of books or podcasts or whatever it is, doesn't mean that I don't think it's a good business. I think it's a great business. Um, and I lean on people that obviously spend a lot of their time. Mary Kate is a huge consumer of podcasts a lot of the people here are huge consumers of podcasts so it's just for me they update you yeah right? yeah i mean listen <laughs> if there's something that really i want to hear yeah because i think it's interesting or i want to hear it for business research purposes i'll listen to it for a little while for sure but my point is, is it's not part of my routine yeah okay good to know yeah. before i ask you my final question where can everybody catch up with you online sounds like instagram and twitter what's your your handles instagram for sure twitter second but far second but those are the two ryan harwood 27 so it's ryan harwood 27 and how do we follow gallery and pure wow and all those fun things instagram is where we put a lot of our resources so i would go to at pure wow on instagram at 1 37 p.m one is spelled out. I think they're doing an amazing job on Instagram right I'm now. I'm very impressed with what I see from 137, even though I'm like, this is, a, it's so cool to me how it's a, it's a different feel, but it's still just at the highest level. Very, very good content. Thank you. 
and we're just getting started. Like, yeah. you know, we're, we're hiring and staffing up on that front. So right now we had to like just build a little bit of a brand ethos, but you're about to start seeing some fire content on those channels. Okay. They're hiring. So don't send a cover letter, <laughs> send a quick DM on Instagram, and then also say, I am also sending this to you in a very brief email there so you go. don't miss it. And there you then go. maybe... Ryan will be in brief okay. emails, brief <laughs> emails. <laughs> okay. What does it mean to you, Ryan, to go after the life that you want? I think it's all about constantly recalibrating to make sure that you are happy. So it's easy to get into a rut and a routine where you think you are because like, that's just what you've always done type thing. Um, but I think if you can take a step back and really understand if like what's going on in your life is this what is actually making you happy? Are you fulfilled? Are you smiling when you wake up in the morning, excited to do what you're about to do? That's what it's all about for me. Thanks for being on. Thank you for having me. All right, let's catch some details from my chat with Ryan. First and foremost, forget the cover letter on your resume. What a tip here. A little controversial. And you know what? It depends on your audience. This is what's right if you're approaching Ryan and maybe another type of hiring executive, but know your audience. And in Ryan's particular situation, he would prefer a two to three line paragraph in an email with your resume in it, or just introducing yourself, no resume. Just say something good. Say something tailored for the person. Do your homework. There is no more firing off the resume to a bunch of people today, so I'm sitting in front of the TV. That doesn't work. You need more preparation if you want to stand out. Next, be yourself. Be genuine. When you're not being you, it's not sustainable. You have to look at yourself in the mirror when people are saying, hey, I disagree with you or I agree with you. And if you're standing on someone else's principles, what are you going to do with that down the line? Be yourself. Be unapologetic about it. And if you want to approach your boss and ask for a little bit more money, make sure you've made yourself invaluable. How did you go above and beyond? Not just in hyperbole, but in proven results. Calendar, Bible. Inbox, to-do list. I personally believe in this. Ryan does it the same way. It might be different for you. Texting might be the way to go, but Google Calendar is Bible. I love when everybody backs me up on this because it is my life. You know I'm the calendar blocking queen. And so I just love to hear that Ryan's tip was, hey, check your calendar. Make the time for what you got to do. What an awesome chat. Thank you so much, Ryan, for welcoming me into the Pure Wow offices to chat with you. It was so great. And I'm, I know I'm going to get such good feedback from you guys, especially those of you who are looking for a job right now. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you love more advice straight to your earbuds, I'd like to send you a few simple steps for living your best life every day. And that is my free audio training, the seven essential details for going after the life that you want. If you'd like to receive this audiogram, it is is simple. Ready? Step one, subscribe to this podcast. Step two, screenshot that you have subscribed. No matter what the podcast player, I don't care. Did you subscribe? It qualifies. Screenshot it. Three, email that screenshot to hello at detailspodcast.com with audiogram, please, in the subject line, and we will get that free audio training right over to you. All those steps are in the show notes, which are at detailspodcast.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it as always. If you would like to discover even more actionable details, head over to Amy TV by typing the URL in your browser, youtube.com slash Amy TV, or you can search my name, Amy Landino in your YouTube app. Remember, subscribe for good vibes, kiss the ones you love and go after the life you want. Cheers. Cheers.